Imagine the scenario. You are in the woods and you're lost. Maybe you're not lost specifically. Maybe it's not life or death, but you certainly don't want to be where you're at. You don't really know where you're going. What is the right first step? One option would be to figure out where you want to go. Where is base camp? Where is the nearest town? Where is the nearest trail at? How do I get out of here? Alternatively, you could find the trail. Is there a path somewhere that I could take? Well, most people would tell you the most important thing for you to consider if you're lost in the woods is to figure out where you are. That's the first step. Once you know where you are, now you kind of know what your possibilities are. Now you can try to figure out what that next step is. Where is that town that you're trying to find? Where is that trail that you're trying to get to? Basically, where do you want to go from where you're at? And then, what's the best way to get there? That's the correct order. Figure out where you're at, figure out where you want to go, figure out how to get there. What you find is that living the good financial life is much like this hiking scenario. If you start out trying to think of where you want to go without first understanding where you're at, you might be picking goals, if you will. You might be picking targets or possibilities that aren't even possible, setting yourself up for some disappointment. If you spend your time figuring out what are the action steps, what is my path, but you don't know where you're going or where you're starting, you're just turning your wheels for no reason. You have to first figure out where you're at. And that covers a lot of different things. What's your net worth? What's your cash flow look like? What are your beliefs about money? What's your overarching philosophy in life, in, in your financial life? You have to get clear about where you're at first before you can figure out where you're going and how to get there. That's what we're going to talk about today and this Money Health presentation. Hey, it's Derek Hagan, financial therapist, writer, and speaker, here with another Money Health presentation where we're going to talk about living the good financial life. First thing we want to make sure we understand is there are things that are inside our control and things that are outside our control. And we need to get really, really clear about that. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So over here we have things that are inside your control. Let me grab a pen. This is it. This is the, the circle of things you can control. Things that you can influence. Things that you can influence that you can do in your control. Everything else, everything else out here, you can't control that. Completely outside of your control. Now the second piece though is we want to make sure that we're looking at things that matter. It has to matter. So what does this mean? Right here, where you're focusing here on this intersection of things that you can control and things that matter. Because there are things for which you can control that don't matter. This is how much time you spend on social media. That's inside your control, but it doesn't really matter. There are other things that matter that you can't control. This might be what the stock market does. Now that, you could argue, matters, but you can't control it. So it's not worth worrying about it because it's outside of your control. And then you got all this stuff out here that we were talking about earlier. This is the stuff that is both outside your control and doesn't matter. Literally not worth your time at all. So as we talked about earlier, before you can figure out where you're going, before you can figure out what's the best path to get there, you have to figure out where you're at. Where are you right now? And this covers things like what you owe, whom you owe, what you own, where you own it, why you own it. What are your beliefs about money? What's your philosophy about money? What are your values? What's important to you? Everything needs to be specific to you, not society. You need to have confidence to do this yourself. And we got to figure out what's that starting point. And we've talked, if you've been following me for any time, you've heard of this concept of money scripts. Money scripts are those unconscious beliefs about money that drive all of our behaviors. Now, they can be good or bad. 
It's just a belief about money, kind of a rule that we follow. Money should be saved and not spent, for example, is a money script. I deserve to spend money on myself, is a money script. I don't deserve to spend money on myself, is the alternate money script to that. Now, a money script is neither good nor bad, but they can be unhelpful. And it's when they're unhelpful that we have to worry about it. So if you've got something between you and where you want to go, but you can't get there because there's this money script in the way, unhelpful money script, that's preventing you from getting there, then you need to start identifying and addressing those unhelpful beliefs and behaviors. And now you also want to be clear on what are your values? What is important to you? What are your life aspirations? What kind of life do you want? Design your life. Most people don't ever take the time to do this. If you do this, you're well ahead of the game. Without doing this, without identifying the intersection of your money and your values, you're going to be far more susceptible to advertisers. You're going to be far more susceptible to those proverbial Joneses. Because you're going to think, you're going to go through your, your social media feed and think, oh, they're, on, they're taking better vacations than me. Why don't I take those vacations? They have a better car than I have. Why don't I have that car? But once you know what your values are, you can align your money and your use of values. Otherwise, right here, your money, but not your values, this is the Joneses. That's the Joneses. You want to be square in this intersection. That's where you're going to find your good life. And now remember, now you're crystal clear about where you're at, what money needs to do for you, what beliefs are getting in the way. But now you have to choose where you want to go. And this is why we talk about those values first. Because if you don't have a lens through which you can view where you want to go, you're going to end up going and live somebody else's life. You're going to say, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to get that big house on the cul-de-sac with the European cars, right? Now, if I just described you, it might sound like I'm making fun of you. This is just the common uh, life that people pursue. This is very quite possibly your ideal life and within your values. If that's true, good for you. But for most people, this is just kind of what society tells us to do. This is what our bosses are doing. This is what our coworkers are doing. And so we think we need to chase down that American dream over here. Right? We got that American dream, and we just blindly go that way. But what if that doesn't fit our values? If that doesn't fit our values, we need to go somebody else, somewhere else. And we can. We have choice to go anywhere else, anywhere that we want to go. It is literally up to you. And so you pick somewhere. You pick somewhere. You know where you want to be. You know where this is. right? And you're over here. If these are not the same thing, Something needs to change. If you want to go somewhere where you're not, something needs to change. And you need to sit down and consider this. How important is it? How important is it to get from there to here? Is it important at all? How ready are you? I'm supposed to say ready. We want to know how ready you are because being having it be important and being ready for it aren't the same thing. You might know people who smoke cigarettes, for example, and they want to quit. Now, this is different from people that are consciously choosing to smoke cigarettes because they want to and they know the risks and they're taking those risks. There are people who are addicted and want to quit but still go and do it. So they know it's important to stop smoking. They might even have confidence that they can do it, but they're not ready to because it means there's going to be a life switch. That means they're going to have to maybe change who their friends are. That means they're going to have to change what kind of places they go to, what kind of activities they do. And finally, confidence. Are you confident that you can change? Because if you lack confidence, then you're not going to, you're not going to step out onto the street. Remember at the beginning, we talked about 
getting really clear about focusing on what you can control and making sure that those things matter. Now, now let's, let's further that and say you really need to focus only on what you can control. And now this is why I don't like goals. You've read this before if you've been following me for any time. We don't want goals. Goals are outcome based. For example, you're a salesperson, you have a target, you have a goal of increasing your sales by 20% this quarter. Now what if you increased your sales by 22%? Yes, you're happy because you beat 20%, but what if 30% was possible? Are you still happy? Or are you playing this game? I gotta leave that 8% so I can get that next quarter and now you're starting this little game around the, the quarterly hoops that you have to jump through, right? Or maybe you didn't get 20%, maybe you got 18% growth, but what if 18% was all that was possible and you maximized your growth? 20% is arbitrary. Goals are arbitrary. They're outcome focused. And you can't control an outcome. What you can control is the process. Focus on the process, not the outcome. Develop a good system. And here's the way you can do that. Think about what goals you might want to do. Set a path. Figure out how you may achieve those goals, and then strip out the goal. Strip out any obsession. Strip out any attachment to the actual outcome. Bonus points if you can set up your system in a way that you win no matter what that outcome is. And when you get down to cash flow management, cash flow management is let's figure out your net worth. Now, your net worth. It's just what you own minus what you owe. Okay, so this is the jargon here is your assets minus your liabilities. So in this own section, you're talking about your house, right? You're talking about your bank accounts. You're talking about your cash. You're talking about your savings account, your investment account, retirement accounts, jewelry, cars campers, boats, everything that you own. That's called your assets. But then you also have to strip out what you owe. And this is your mortgage. This is your credit cards. This is your car loans, student loans, and so on. And then you get your net worth. You want to focus on growing that net worth, not growing your assets. You also want to look at your cash flow statement. Now your cash flow statement is simply Money coming in and money going out. How much is coming in, how much is going out. This is your traditional budgeting. Nobody likes that word. We can call it a spending plan. I like to call it a savings plan. This here is a savings plan. It's an automated savings plan. Auto. Why is it automated? Because you set this system up. This is a system. You set this system up ahead of time. So you got to count one. Maybe this is paying off debt. Maybe you count two is your savings account, your emergency fund. Maybe you count three is re college kids, you know, college savings. Maybe step four is your retirement. You can have as many accounts in your system as you want. And then every two weeks, every month, twice a month, the income comes in and it first fills up this bucket. Once that's full, then it overflows and it fills up this bucket. Then it overflows and it fills up this bucket and so on. And then you get to spend what's left over. If you take care of the savings right away, the rest will take care of itself. Now, just because you can spend this, that's fine. But we want to do this based on your values. Right? So we'll, you want to make sure that you're spending some time to align your money and your values. We talked to that, that, about that already. But if you take care of all the savings, then you don't have to do this traditional budget where you're splitting your money into envelopes, you're going to all the cash, you're tracking every penny. If that stuff works for you, that's great. For most people, it doesn't. We don't want to become spreadsheet experts logging into our accounts every single day. We just want an easy system that works. I want to talk a little bit about this thing called negativity bias. We all have a negativity bias. Our brains are like Velcro for negative events. And 
Teflon for positive ones. And there's a real reason for this. If our ancestors didn't pay attention to threats, that might have been the end of them. If they failed to find an opportunity, they lived until tomorrow to find another opportunity. You had to spend more time on the negatives, on the threats. So the antidote to this is gratitude. Your life isn't as bad as you think. Even on your worst day, think about it. think about your worst day in the last three months. It was that you were angry, you punched a wall, you were crying your eyes out, you, you yelled at somebody, you got in a fight with somebody, you had a breakdown. Whatever your worst day is, there are at least one billion people, billion with a B, a billion people on earth that would consider their prayers answered if they could trade places with you in that exact moment. Stop taking your life for granted. Stop focusing on the negatives and have some gratitude. What's going well in your life? You know, what's happened that might not have happened? You know, what are the lucky events that have happened in your life? Be grateful for that. What do you still have that you could have lost, but you haven't lost it? You woke up today. Awesome. Be grateful for that. Right? The sun's shining. Awesome. It smells good outside. That's great. You were able, you were able to save some money. Sure, you wanted to save $1,000, but you only saved $800. Stop focusing on the 200 you didn't save. Focus on the 800 that you did. Because the more grateful you are, the happier you're going to be. This is a fact. I know. Negative things happen. And that's okay. Stop pretending like life should be this easy street. When you think about life, you think about your ideal future. We tend to think, yep, it's going to be easy peasy. Nothing bad is ever going to happen. That's, that's a bad way to think, and let me tell you why. On the happiness scale, if this is baseline, this is zero, and this is happy, and this is sad, okay, in this new future, this becomes the new baseline. Which is good, you think, right? And we move the baseline up to here. That seems great, except we get used to things. And as soon as we're used to that, that becomes the status quo. And now we need to feel extra happy in order to feel a little bit of joy. And what we feel regular now becomes the new sad. And sad today becomes completely depressed. Static is boring. Status is not going to work for anybody. These negative events are what give these positive events meaning. You want them to happen. They make you resilient. And resiliency, if resiliency is bouncing back to baseline after a bad event, post-traumatic growth means not only did you get back to baseline, but you did better. You learned something. Bad things are going to happen. That's fine. What did you learn? What was the lesson that you picked out of that? Don't leave a failure without a lesson. That's the only failure, is not taking a lesson away. Some of these things are outside of our control. Remember we talked about no control. So if they're outside of our control, what's the point in being angry about that or sad about that or frustrated about that? You couldn't control it. You can control your reaction to that event. You can figure out, was there anything that I could have done that may have altered this event for me? For example, I can't control what the market does, and the market crashed. Well, what did I learn? I learned that I can control how much of my money goes into the stock market. Or maybe this was in your control. And you learned, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. And now you can apply that lesson going forward. The bad, the bad events in life make the good events happy. Let's talk about money mindfulness. Money mindfulness doesn't mean you need to sit and meditate. Although if you meditate, this is going to be easier for you. Having a, having a mindfulness-based practice is something that I can't recommend enough. But that's kind of outside the scope of financial therapy and financial health. Money mindfulness is just simply becoming aware. Becoming aware of your use of money. 
Now, it used to be in the past when we'd pay with cash, we parted with our cash. You know, we had, we had cash, you know, and we had to count it out. We had to count out 10, 20, 30, $35 and 15 cents. We gave the cash away and they gave us change back. That was a very physical event using cash. We physically were parted with our cash, physically parted with money. Or you wrote a check. Now, if you remember checks, you had to write the amount, $80, and then you had to write the amount out uh, in words. And then you had to go to your register. And so you had to write it down three times. Now it happens. Now we go in and we pay with our phone. We go in and we touch our card to a thing. We have no idea. Think about the last time you went out for lunch. How much did it cost? If you're paying with checks, you would know. If you're paying with cash, you would know. And you might have a range. You might know it was between $3 and $15. But you don't really know exactly how much it was. My mindfulness is bringing this awareness of your financial decisions back into conscious awareness, making sure you're making these decisions with intention, with the logical part of your brain, not with the emotional part of your brain. And then when it comes to having conversations about money, money is stressful. Having conversations about money is even more stressful. Now, if you're anything like most people in the world, when you have a discussion about money, you have this, this, this drive to be right, to prove how smart you are. This is my point, I'm going to tell you my point, you should listen to my point. So much of fights come from one person's point of view, second person's point of view, and there's no overlap there. What if instead of trying to push my view on the other person, what if I listen for the other person's point of view? Seek to understand, not to be right. All right, so this is just a little crash course. These are the kind of the steps that you might want to consider. And if you follow these steps, if you think about how money fits into your overall life, this is not just an either or thing. This is not something that's over here like a little hobby. Money is, is an integral part of your life. Figuring out what that role is in your life, aligning that money with your values, learning to talk about money, in a, in a more important way, understanding how to spend money in a way that's important to you, making sure you get the savings taken care of so that future you can also benefit, not just present you. Do all these things and that's good money health.